just saw another sign that said it was starting in three. There is, yeah. I'm inserting a lecture right now just because some of these clubs are starting in two, and I'm going to do a short thing to okay. intro the uh, workshop time. Okay. So, just cover some extra material that people seem like they might not have completely understood. So, since there's, uh, there's some confusion in the schedule as to whether anything's starting at 2 or not, I figured we would kick off a uh, workshop time when you all can work on the curriculum, uh, and uh, we'll kind of wander around and make sure you're doing alright. Uh, but, to start that out, I wanted to cover a few of the slides that I zoomed past, uh, just in case anybody finds value in seeing a bit more detail about how functions work, how you use them as uh, callbacks, how the arguments object works, that sort of thing. So what I briefly touched on was that the input to a function, one, one function input, is pretty similar to a local variable for that function. The only real difference is that a function input automatically gets bound to whatever you're passing in. So in this case, uh, the, ver uh, the value high, the string down at the bottom, is available inside this function as input. But if I make it a local variable, it obviously has no automatic binding. If I want to bind it as a local variable, I need to be able to refer to the arguments coming in. And they don't have names, so I would have to use this special uh, the special object called arguments. Arguments is kind of like an array, it's not quite an array, but it's got a bunch of ordinarily, ordinarily sequenced values, and the first one is the first thing that gets passed in, and the second one is the second thing that gets passed in, so. Now this arguments object seems to confuse some people, and it, t it specifically confuses people when they are looking at arguments passed into a function that don't match the named arguments. So let's say this one has zero arguments, zero name parameters, and yet we're passing in one argument. Up here, no parameters, passing in an argument. The arguments array still contains however many were passed in. So this arguments object will always have the number of values that got passed in in between the parentheses. It's super useful. If I log arguments, what do you expect it to log? Yeah, sort of an array-like thing. It's the value that got passed in. If I pass in high and three, then arguments set is an array-like thing containing high and three, even though there's only one main parameter here. If I were to name three parameters, but still only pass in two, this continues to log the ones that got passed in, regardless of how many names I specify. So, there's an association between what gets passed in, what is currently named arguments here, and what gets logged out. Yeah? If I did that in, in C, it would cause an error. If you pass a different number of arguments than are specified in the name list, yeah, and list. like in other languages, and so what? So JavaScript tries not to be very strict about types or anything uh, like anything that might be done differently or dynamically. Okay. JavaScript tries to allow it at parse time uh, and throw an error if one happens at runtime. Okay. You get a certain kind of protection from C because you've said this is a valid argument signature and you can pass this set of things in and this is not a valid argument. If I haven't specified it, it's not a valid argument signature. Uh, JavaScript doesn't give you that protection, but what you get in exchange is a lot of flexibility. So iterating over a list of arguments is really easy in JavaScript. In C, it's much harder. Oh yeah. May, actually, it may not even be possible. Is it possible? Uh, I do, no, I, 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 yeah, don't I don't know. I don't have a way to iterate over the argument. List I have no idea. 
I've never tried it. <laughs> yeah. um, it turns out to be useful if you want the calling code to be allowed to specify any number of arguments. If, it's, if for example, it's a merge function that takes any number of arrays and merges them into one big array, it's kind of nice to write that as one function call with many inputs. Uh, JavaScript would let you do that. So if I were to log argument zero, that means I'm asking for just hi, just this first thing that got passed in. What I find interesting here is that we are passing in three arguments to a function that has four named parameters that interacts with exactly one of those named parameters, and no more, and also interacts with the arguments object. So that's at least three different numbers. Three, four, one, and you can say two. It considers two of the arguments. It only uses one of them by name. There are four names and three inputs. I'm trying to demonstrate that these are so disjointed that you need to think of those independently. The number of arguments to a function that you're going to operate on is up to you. The number of parameters that you name, that's a different decision. The number you want to pass in when you're calling the function, another completely different decision. They will often converge, but there are cases where you might do them a little differently, case to case. Uh, what do you think we're going to log here? In the front, by the camera. Um. I haven't told you the answer, so it's really just checking your intuition. Undefined. Exactly. Nothing got passed in. Anytime a, a parameter is named, but no argument is sent passed in associated with it, it's just undefined. As usual, I can't log arguments. I can't log anything outside of its scope. And the, the argument's keyword is only meaningful inside a function. So it's not a variable that's automatically introduced into the global scope. It's just kind of an identifier that's automatically available inside any function. Again, I can't use dot access. Let's talk about masking. This is an example of masking. Inside here, calling the inner function means that we are going to log the input to the inner function. Even though I passed high in as input here, this log arguments, it's talking about the arguments to the inner function. If I were to refer to input, the inner input would mask the outer input. As exemplified here. Input, 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 input. So that's function. Before I move on to callbacks, are there any questions about the anatomy of a function and how you use arguments inside them? Let's talk about passing functions as arguments. This trips a lot of people up. Here you have a function that if you call it, it'll log the uppercase version of its input, and we decide perhaps that we want to do that not now but later. And the question is how do we accomplish that? We've got this lovely set timeout function that registers a function as needing to be called. So what set timeout does is it takes a function as its first argument and it makes a promise to you that it will call that function down the line. What is being passed as the first argument to set timeout in this code sample? Uh, close? Not quite. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. So here we have a line of code that is situated as the first argument to set timeout. What was the question again? What is being passed? What is set timeout receiving in this case as its first argument? Semicolon in the middle 
of this function invocation. If we were to collapse this code, it would look like this. Right? This is what's being passed as the first argument. So what what is that really? Uh, not quite. It's actually a statement. You can tell because of the semicolon. It's an expression statement. So it's going to try to evaluate this thing, and then it's going to say, sweet, I'm done with the statement. And then it's going to go, blah, blah, blah. And it's going to throw a parser. <laughs> I have my uh, console hooked up to make that noise whenever I throw a parser. <laughs> um, <laughs> So if I was to take this semicolon off, now what is going to be passed in as the first argument to set time? Whatever that function returns when you pass in high. Right. And since it's written up here? The uppercase version of high. Uh, close. If this said return. Oh. Yeah. But actually it's logging. So it's not returning anything, so nothing? Right. So it's passing undefined. So when that function runs, it logs something out and then evaluates to undefined. Absolutely right. Let's put this stuff back. Okay. So this first line, or rather this first argument, first of all, it probably ought to be indented, right? Just for visual clarity. But it does not log anything one second later. There's a semicolon, gotta get rid of that. And worse yet, we're calling the function. Nothing is gonna happen a second from now. We want the behavior of fun running, we want that to happen one second from now. So it doesn't make sense to call it now and pass its result, right? Our goal is not to call a function at all. Our goal is to have it run later. So, how would we prevent this function from running? In the loop. Put another function in? Yes. There's a simpler solution that does not quite work, which is you just take the parens off and then it's not running. Okay. But, so, so now we are passing the function, because fun evaluates to a function, and that's what we're passing in as our first argument to set time on. Seems awesome. Unfortunately, there, how, the word high is gone. It's completely gone. How does it know what to? Uh, how does it know what to specify? What to log? What What is its input supposed to be? So there's a different technique that you use to solve this problem. You wrap a function, an anonymous, a, a, a uh, an anonymous function, around the code that you want to run. Now we suddenly have to undo what we did before. We need to add back the parens and add back the semicolon. Because no longer are we passing, uh, no longer is this line an expression, which is to say an argument to a function. An argument to a function can't be like a statement or a series of statements. It has to be an expression that can be passed along and composed into a larger expression. From s to this n paren is a very large expression that contains a tiny expression, just a little variable look in the middle. So once we wrap it in a function, suddenly from here to here, those are supposed to be statements. So we add this stuff back in, and now it's valid. So this was fine. We were allowed to do this. It's just, it only works with functions that take no arguments. So we added a function that takes no arguments and turned it back into a statement notation. This is the conversion and jockeying back and forth that you will need to do if you are trying to write callbacks and you're having trouble, you're getting parse errors, the whole fleet of errors you're likely to get around this, logic errors and whatnot. If you are not thinking of the statement notation, which is what we see here, as different from the expression notation, which is what we're trying to do here and what we're succeeding at here, you have to use the correct technique. Unfortunately, it's a different technique for every situation. Are there any questions about this anonymous callback wrapping your lines of code that you want to run? All right. Yep. Actually, 
ask you one question. Yeah. Is, uh, is there another way that people ever do that? Or is that pretty much the way to do it? To do, well, what's the, what's the scenario you're trying to, to do? Uh, well, that's, so that is a callback function, is it? That's so in this, in this case, the outer anonymous function is yep. the callback. Okay. Because it's the thing, it is the function object that gets passed to set timeout for the purpose of being called back at some point in the future. Okay. And it is, um, forgive me for throwing out words that I don't know what they mean. Sorry. <laughs> um, I heard people talking about uh, promises. Yeah. Is that, is, that, is that a different way of accomplishing the same thing? Yes, or? good call. What are promises? Promises are a slightly more difficult to conceptualize, not that much more difficult, but slightly more difficult, and much easier to read alternative to using callbacks. Well, you don't, you don't really escape using callbacks, but you escape using nested callbacks. Okay. Promises require that you have callbacks anyway, it's just they don't nest inside one another. Okay. Yeah. Is there a difference between promise and deferred, or are those both basically? The same same idea. Two concepts. Are they, are they, are they the same physical code, just people refer to it by different words? I so believe so. In different ways. I have not detected people using the word deferred and promise in different ways. There may be a technical distinction that I'm not aware of, but I have not heard. Well, created deferred, but just never physically created a promise in one way. I suspect it's the same thing. It's possible that. Those terms have specific meanings in other languages, and in JavaScript, there just there just aren't enough different ideas that they've sort of diversified. I'm thinking in terms of like when you call like uh, in Angular, you call the HTTP service and return the promise. Uh -huh. But if you need to mock one, you have to create a deferred. So it's like they refer to it by two different names. Oh, interesting. Um, that sounds like it actually is a difference. Because deferred has a different success failure handler. Basically, a deferred takes you stack your functions. For your uh, for success, failure, and other things like three sets, and then a promise. I'm, I don't know enough about it to talk intelligently about it. But yeah, I will. I will look that up after because I find that really interesting. Um, I'm only familiar with the nuances of promises, uh, not of deferred. Oh, deferred generally extends a promise. Okay. Right. I'm going to now even as we speak. Cool. I just network with the guy. When the internet is out, just ask Marcus. Uh, he'll probably know. Uh, properties and values. Property values and methods. So I want to like clarify objects a little bit, just give you a hint as to how broadly you can use objects for storing things. If I was to try and use null, which as a value is technically an object, right? If I was to try to use null, to store properties, it tells me that's not allowed. That's just one of the rules of one of the special values. It's a primitive value. It is still an object, <coughs> yes, but it, uh, it just doesn't really allow you to interact with it like you would an object. The same is true of undefined. Both of these values are kind of like really uh, inviolable. You're not allowed to set properties on them or try to do property access of any sort. If you set, if you talk about an object that is a uh, certain type of primitive, like false numbers, strings, and you intend to assign a property to that thing, nothing will happen. And later, when you interact with it, it will log undefined. So some objects, specifically the primitive objects, are immutable. Trying to edit them has no effect. Of course, this is just an expansion of what we've examined already, but I want to explore it a little more carefully. In this case, since we're looking at a string, And like the, like the false value, a string can't be modified. Or sorry. We're examining what properties can exist on an object. If we put a number on an object and then log it, it should log the number. 
If we put a string on an object and then log it, it should log the string. If we put undefined on an object and log it, what would you expect us to have? What would you expect to get locked out? Would you get undefined? That's certainly the expectation. And in fact, you would get that. So my question then is, is there a difference between the code you see here and the code that lacks this line of code, opt x equals undefined? If we had not put that code in there at all, would there be any difference in the runtime at all? Let's start with what gets logged. Would there be any difference in what gets logged? Are you asking if there's a difference between undefined versus an explicit undefined? I'm asking if there is a difference between the runtime of this program and this one. I don't know that there's a. I mean, I don't know that there's a real difference. I mean, undefined is undefined as far as I know. Sure. So in this world, there is no property x. We would be logging undefined because no property was found. And in this world, the property x stores the value undefined. And the question really is, do we see those as meaningfully different? I'm curious about your intuition. There's no way you can get this right. You can just either guess to implement it the same way the language designer did, or guess the opposite. You either think that there's a difference between these two programs, or that there is no difference between these two programs. The one where we set something to undefined, or the one where we just leave nothing in there. Those are either completely equivalent, or they are meaningfully different. So what I'd like to do is hold your arms out this way if you think there is any difference at all, this way if you think there is no runtime difference in any way. Uh, wait, is this, there's a dip, there is a difference, there is no difference. Difference, no difference. Even split. Okay, there is a very slight difference. An object can have a property that is set to undefined. It's possible for it to, to, to have a property that carries this value, this undefined value. Remember, undefined is just like a, a flag. It's, a, it's an indicator of a certain meaning. Interestingly, if we were to iterate across obj, in this world, we would see that there's one key, x. But in this world, we would not see any keys. It would iterate over no keys. Yeah? Um, what, so, uh, t two things. Uh, first, that object, it, it's not an array. It's a, I, and sorry, this is a really ignorant <laughs> question. No, that's what's saying. <laughs> um, what, what, uh, so, do I think of X like I do in in, in a C plus plus world where I'm I'm like I define here are the five variables that are part of the well X system. remember is not a variable X is a property of an object. It's a pro okay that, that's what my okay and and it is an object because you defined it with the curly brackets up top. Yes, obj is an object, okay. and then this is trying to access the property and key X of that object. Okay. So it's very similar, or it, it looks very similar to a, uh, an array, but I, I couldn't... You're, by similar to an array, you mean these brackets remind you of how you access properties in an array, uh, elements in an array. That's right. Yeah. So, reminds, but. I'm not sure whether you're here from the first session, but the first session in the morning we covered the complete equivalence okay. of bracket and dot access. They both mean the same thing. Okay. And uh, although in other languages, brackets are used for accessing elements of an array, and dots are used for accessing properties of an object, uh, in JavaScript, those are the same idea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but, but in an array, could, could I do if the, could I do array dot one and I could get the second value of the array? You absolutely could if property keys were allowed to start with a digit. If you wanted to do that, you'd have to expand it out into bracket access okay. because you can't use dot and then any numeral. Well, could, you would have to instead say bracket quote numeral okay. end quote or Thank just bracket numeral yes bracket. Okay. Cool. Thank you. No sweat. So uh, in this world we are allowed to set things to null as well, just like we were allowed to set them to undefined. We are allowed to put objects inside objects, so here we're putting a brand new object literal at the key x. And crazy enough, we're allowed to put 
objects inside of themselves. So this would log the original object. Obj.obj.obj.obj.obj is obj because it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> Um, so we can put arrays in there, we can put functions in there, and that's when it starts to get uh, dicey. People start to want to think of that as a method. It's kind of a method, I suppose, but it's really just a value that we've stored in an object. That's, that's what it really is. Some people think that when you access a method by its name, you're going to get the result of evaluating it. But that wouldn't happen unless we were to... Let's, it doesn't matter whether we use dots or brackets. In both cases, we are accessing the function itself. It would, we would need to put parens next to that machine, press the on button, in order for it to evaluate. So don't get confused and think it does this. It's not what it does. Nor does it do it when you use the dot. Dot is still just brackets. If you put parens next to it, even if you put parens next to it using bracket access, that's when you're running the function. That's it. So, you've now seen all of the slides in the intro sections. Uh, this is the pre course curriculum that we give to our students on the way in to Hack Reactor. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will equip you well for the curriculum that you've got in your hands. If you have not already downloaded the curriculum, if you are new to the lesson, it's right here. jsconf2014.hackreactor.com Feel free to go clone that repo and start working on the curriculum in there. It's explained in the readme. Uh, also, if you're new, uh, I'm Marcus Phillips. I'm from Hack Reactor, where we teach this stuff. Uh, every seven weeks we have a new class of immersion students coming in. Uh, and if you're interested in more details, uh, let me or someone from the team know. Uh, otherwise, get cracking and please flag someone down if you need any help with the exercises. We're here to kind of support you getting through it. Thank you.
in the GitHub repository. Yeah, so, yeah.
they are the same language. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of like I wonder zero. if this is like a, what uh, more about more about what I was looking for a switch. Yeah, a switch condition. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, this is a complicated, <laughs> hard,
Get a tea. I have to start the oh, lecture. Sure, sure. Is there anybody available to help? What do you need, Marcus?
Who here was here already before for one of the other things? Who here is new? Okay, welcome all. So, uh, if you have already been here for one of the sessions, then you know this. These are very interactive sessions. The intent is that we are going to uh, move forward together on our shared confusion about these topics. Uh, something that I got a chance to talk to everybody who's already been here about, but I think it's important that we reiterate for the new folks. Uh, your questions are extremely valid to the room. I want to explain a brief uh, problem that you face as a listener of a lecture. If the lecturer just says, hey, does anybody know blank? Someone will just shout out the answer, because statistically one of you knows the answer. But from your perspective, as an audience member, this will create the illusion that on average the people around you know way more than you do. And that's an illusion. It's an illusion that we have to break. We did a really great job this morning with the people who stayed for a couple of sessions in a row. It seemed like everybody was getting really active and that's super, super valuable. I'm going to just repeat things that don't need repeating because I, I don't really trust that I've made it clear yet. Now, that's not your fault, that's my problem. I need to make it as clear as possible. It's very hard to know. Uh, which stuff has landed, which stuff I've repeated enough times and in enough ways to be clear about. So I really rely on you guys to, uh, to pipe up with anything that confuses you. It is very definitely okay and valid and, uh, and in fact, uh, I depend upon it. Okay, so, uh, introductions. I'm Marcus Phillips. I'm from Hack Reactor. We run a little school. It teaches people to be professional developers in 12 weeks. Uh, so every seven weeks, a new group of people shows up, and we go through a lot of this fundamental material. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people experience the same stuff over and over again. So I'm going to be kind of guessing and anticipating what it is that you are confused by. As it happens, you've just come to the easiest session of the entire week. This session is incredibly easy. It's Node. How do you know? Node is just stunningly, alarmingly straightforward. It is so simple. For, for a long time, I thought Node was like a... I don't even know what I imagined it to be, but it was voodoo for sure. It was really intimidating, and I thought it's got all of this complexity. I, I don't even know what people say, no mods package, I don't... I'm not sure what's happening anymore. One day, I gotta sit down and learn Node. And when I sat down to learn Node, I, you know, I actively researched it and tried to figure it out and understand it, and it got really, it got more and more complex and sprawling until finally I struck on what it really was. It's about one sentence long, what Node is, and that's all you need to know. So here's the sentence, you're welcome to walk up and leave when I'm done. <laughs> Node is JavaScript that's not running in your browser. <laughs> and that's it. Let me just show you some JavaScript running in a browser. <laughs> Let's go to the JSConf website. Open up the Chrome console and say, uh, I don't know, 3 plus 3. Good to know. So JavaScript running in my console and my browser, we're all very familiar with this. Seems reasonable. Someone at one point said, okay, maybe I want to get access to some more stuff. The browser puts you in this little box. Maybe I want access to some of that stuff. Sure. Maybe. Uh, I want, maybe I want to run JavaScript from the command line as a cron job. Raise your hand if you've ever used a cron. Okay, so there you go. You're working in the command line. You want to run JavaScript. Type node. Boom, done, everybody go. <laughs> so, for whatever reason, Node has accumulated this mystique as being a, a really rich, complicated thing. And in fact, the ecosystem around Node is pretty nuanced and interesting. But as a fundamental concept, if you're in the room thinking, I don't know what Node is, I don't know how it works, I don't know what I'm doing, believe it or not, you're basically done. What I'm going to do next, and this is mainly going to be a uh, Mainly going to be a, a quick demo followed by you guys trying to do whatever brings you to this room. You go, you start working on that stuff again, and our TAs will circulate and try to help solve any problems you're actually having on the basis of having this orientation to them. So the slight differences that you're going to encounter are A, how you define files, 
right? So in, in the browser, you make a script file and you import it using an HTML tag. In Node, uh, I hope it's alright that I use Emacs. Uh, let me know if you can't tell what's going on up there. I'll switch to something that has a mouse and embarrass myself and everyone. Uh, if I Emacs a file like hello world.js, I can type, you know, 3 plus 3 console.log hello and console.log 4 plus 4. Just write some random code. I close it out and I know, just like I did before, but I type the name of the file, hello world. It does the work that that code specifies. A couple of interesting things. Where does the console go? Well, it goes into your terminal. What happened to the work that I couldn't, that didn't con get console log? It got done. The answer was computed, and in this case, thrown away. But if you can write JavaScript in any environment, you can write JavaScript for Node. So there are some aspects of Node that work fundamentally differently. The first is, how do you include other files? How do you include files in the browser? How do you get one file of JavaScript to run or had to be available to another file? In the, with the you have to script. reference it with the script tag? Right. Close. You, you're, you're correct, but I'll, I'll expand on your language to, to, to fully specify it. You use script tags, and in the browser, you have to specify, you have to include one script and then trust that all of that code will have been executed and hopefully it mutates the global scope. And then immediately after that, in the HTML file, you write another script and this new script will run in the same global scope. The fact that both files run in one global scope is the only point of interaction that those two files get. This is kind of problematic. You can't, for example, ha or you can't write a JavaScript file for the browser that says, and by the way, I want this other JavaScript file to run first. You can't do strict dependency management in vanilla JavaScript. You can't specify dependency in one, in one file upon another file. You can't get an invocation, you can't get code to run and receive the result as an input to a file as something that only that file will have access to. It'll have a local name for that, for that dependency. That doesn't work either. It is all the global scope. Every file that runs in the global scope in the browser uh, has access to the same global variables. And so they all just sort of willy-nilly write to the global namespace and hope they don't trample on each other and hope they run in the right order. This is the challenge that we face in the browser. People have written some pretty good tools for getting around that. When uh, folks started writing Node and saying we would like to be, uh, we would like this to be easier. We would like there to be an easier story for importing code. They invented uh, the syntax that we use uh, with require and exports. So let's take a look at that. Let's Emacs hello world again. Let's say I wanted underscore. Let's say I have a copy of underscore. In fact, I can download that briefly. No, I'll just write it. I'll just write it on the screen. Hang on a second. Var underscore equals each. Let's 
exports. No. Not singular. Yes. Cool. So, in this file, this is the underscore file. I've got the source code for underscore approximately, and because I want, I want. Uh, the each function to be available as part of the package that I'm exporting, I make the each function a property of the exports object. The exports object is one of the things that Node gives us to facilitate code being shared between files. Exports is the object that will be made available to other files when they require that file. Let's go to another file and say var underscore Give it the underscore name equals require dot slash underscore. I'm using dot slash because I mean it is in the same folder. So let's give it a shot. Did it work? We can't quite tell yet. It didn't fail, it didn't throw an error. Let's log it. Let's log the underscore object that I got back. It seems to be an object that has the each function on it, right? So this is how you're going to write two files of your own code that depend on one another. Are there any questions about how you would do this? Cool. But I don't want to write underscore myself. I want someone else to write it, and then I just want to download it. So instead, what I'm going to do is take off this dot slash, and that says to Node, please give me the copy of underscore that is in my packages, in my package management system somewhere. Let's see if it works. This will only work if, what do you think? In the red If you have the package. Exactly. So I've taken off dot slash. To clarify, uh, somebody name an underscore, uh, a Node package. Async? Express. What? Express? I probably have Express. Name a package I don't have. What is it? Node mailer. Node mailer. How do you spell it? M-A-I-L-E-R. Uh, one word? Node mailer? Yeah. Cool. So I can require node mailer, and we know that I don't have it locally, <laughs> so I can't say dot slash. I'd like it to be the case that I use a, uh, a package for my package manager. When I run Hello world, it's like, uh, I don't know what that is. So, I have to install a package. I have two options. I can either install it locally to this project, or I can install it globally. Let's just do locally first. <coughs> npm, node package manager, helps you load packages. npm install, node mail. When I run my hello world again, that has required this thing, there it is. I am now logging, instead of underscore, I'm logging the node mailer module. This is what the node mailer module made available to us. Okay. One moment. If we look in my current project folder, we'll see in this list of files the node modules folder. When I npm install, that's where I put it. Let's take a look inside node modules. There's node mailer. If I rm node modules completely, and I try to run hello world again, it's going to fail again. All I have to do is install node mailer again. And it's going to bring it back and put it in. The, it's going to invent that folder. Remember, uh, node modules is gone. But as soon as I install node mailer again, it's going to come back. So that was the local install. You now have the ability to define a dependency on a file, on a uh, on a package that you didn't write. If I want this to be available globally on my system so that I never have to install it for a new project ever again, I would just say dash G. 
This means that my whole system will have access to it. Uh, and it's a little more brittle because I might accidentally start writing software that depends on node mailer without realizing that it's not going to work anywhere, that it that doesn't have it as a global dependency. Instead, I should probably just install it locally and do some work to make sure that uh, that project pulls in its dependencies automatically. And that is about it. That's about all you need to know. The next thing I'd like to do is turn it over to you guys to do the, this is a half hour session, approximately half of which is supposed to be hands on. You do what you're working on and we come help you solve whatever problem you have. Uh, we've gone a, little, a couple of minutes over, but I think it's okay. The next two things I'd like to do are answer questions you guys have about this, this basic stuff and then get to uh, having you guys write some scripts that depend on one another and load scripts that are next to each other from files that are in the same folder and then maybe download and install some NPM packages and try playing with that. Once you've done that, you can write code that interfaces with any of your hardware. The big punchline, the, probably the main reason to use Node, apart from the fact that the browser is a bit complicated and not the best target environment for all applications, is that Node has access to hardware. You can interface with low-level libraries that talk to your network card, but don't need to go through a $.ajax or something like that. They talk to your mouse directly. They talk to the primitives of the system. You can do file system access. If, uh, if you get done loading scripts between, uh, between two different files and you want to try to access uh, a file, that seems like a good next step extra credit. Are there any questions before we turn over to uh, to independent exercise? Yeah. When you say that you have access to the hardware, there's while well, the code is being compiled in the server, right? No when it actually is compiled and, and delivered to the client, right? Ah, sorry. You start. The question was, you get access to the to the hardware when the code is on the server, not when it's on the client. And this is actually a distinction that, this is a spurious distinction. Node code fundamentally does not run on the client. It doesn't run in a browser. It will never, it will never be shipped down to anyone. Node code is just JavaScript, the interpreter, the environment, being run without a browser around it. So if the user if the user has Node on their computer and they type Node into the thing, they will have access to their own hardware. If you, on your server, type Node or whatever, you'll have your, that process will have access to your hardware. It takes a lot of work to get any code to be shipped down to the client, even in Node, even in JavaScript. There are whole tutorials on how you can use the Node execution environment to serve web requests. And in so doing, you are fundamentally only capable of sending down files that perhaps their browser is going to be rendering. And then, then your, the client on the other end will be subject to whatever constraints that runtime environment has. But on your server, you're going to be running Node from the command line. Furthermore, you could be running Node from some machine that is not itself a server. It's just a machine into which you type them. Any other questions? Okay, sweet. If you have not already dabbled with it, uh, I encourage you to find the uh, documentation for Node. These are all of the these are all of the packages available in Node. These are available that by default. Some of them you might have to require. But they all come as part of the node environment. When you need access to the functionality that one of them offers, like for example, console, if you want to log things out, you might need to include the console. Obviously, we didn't have to do that in, the, in my environment. But 
HTTP, you'll probably have to bring in yourself. If you need to make network calls, you don't have $.ajax anymore. You're going to have to require HTTP. So just to remind you how you do that, in here you would say var HTTP equals require. All of a sudden you've got it. All right. So please start a file using terminal, or if you're a Windows user, use uh, whatever they have. Uh, and uh, if you can get two files, one file to make an export and the other file to load it, you're doing good. If you want to take it further than that, our TA should be able to help you with whatever puzzles you're facing. You got about seven minutes before we start the next session, which is keyword this. We'll probably keep hanging out through the break though. It's a half hour break in between.